Uh, good morning and welcome to the 11th meeting of the committee in 2019. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off their mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should ensure that they're turned to silence. Uh, we've received apologies today from Jamie Green, MSP. Uh, agenda, agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. Does the committee agree to take uh, item number three in private, which is consideration of correspondence concerning inter-institutional relations post-Brexit? Okay. The second item of business on the agenda today is an evidence session on the committee's immigration inquiry. And can I welcome to the meeting members of the Scottish Government's expert advisory panel on migration and population. Uh, we have Professor Christina Boswell, the chair of the expert advisory group, as well as Professor David Bell and Professor Rebecca Kay. Thank you all for attending this morning. The purpose of today's session is to take evidence uh, from your group, uh, which the Minister for Migration commissioned uh, to consider recommendations um, from the Max report on EEA migration and the UK government's proposal for a new immigration system after Brexit. And you were specifically tasked to consider the potential impact of these proposals uh, on Scotland. Um, now, I understand that uh, the impact of the proposal is to reduce migration um, between 30% and 50%. I wonder if you maybe were able to summarise what your expert advisory group found the impact of that would be over time on Scotland. Um, thank you very much. If I may, before we start, just give a very brief statement about the capacity um, in which we're giving evidence today. So as you know, we're uh, members of the expert advisory group, um, which was set up to provide advice and analysis to the Scottish Government on migration and population. Um, I want to note, first of all, that we're an interdisciplinary grouping, so today we represent part of the spectrum of expertise in that group, but we couldn't be joined by all colleagues. But I think it's important to note our interdisciplinary nature, uh, because our um, analysis doesn't just cover labour market or fiscal aspects, as, as the Migration Advisory Committee does, but we also look at demographic social effects um, of migration on communities, and we look at the effects on different types of areas within Scotland. Um, and as you know, our first commission, as you noted, looked at the effects of the white paper proposals on areas of devolved competence in Scotland. And because immigration policy, of course, is a reserved competence, we were not tasked with developing policy recommendations. So I think this is an important thing to note. So for that reason, in our um, comments to the committee as EAG members, uh, we will confine our comments to those which respect that remit. So as EAG members, we will not be uh, discussing particular recommendations in relation to immigration policy. But as individual experts, we have in the past obviously analysed and commented on those issues in relation to different recommendations. So if we do stray into that terrain, I think we will simply clarify that we are speaking in our capacity as individual experts uh, rather than EAG members. So if we could note that, that would be appreciated. OK. okay. Um, well, can I just repeat my opening question then, if you don't mind, um, and, and you can answer it in that, in that context. Um, the, projection, the projected reduction in migration is between 30 and 50 per cent over the coming two decades. And I, well, maybe you could start by perhaps giving us an indication on what you think the impact of, of that would be for example, for the provision of public uh, finances, the effect on public finances? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, in relation to that projection, I should uh, introduce the normal caveat that such projections are always very crude and actually extremely difficult to derive, given the uncertainties around the many factors influencing future migration flows. But based partly on the analysis of the distribution of salaries of those who would meet the proposed Tier 2 threshold, uh, and also on analysis of, of recent trends of EU and non-EU migration, uh, we did develop these two scenarios of potential uh, effects of the white paper proposals on migration and one of them respected the analysis of the white paper and assumed an 80% reduction um, and the other one um, uh, was based on our own analysis um, and assumed um, a 70% reduction of EU inflows for work but also then factored in uh, migration of dependents and family reunion, uh, student migration and assumed an outflow rate of 50% and based on this we projected um, that there would be a 50% reduction of EU net migration which would imply an overall 30% reduction of uh, overseas migration to Scotland. Um, now, 
it's very important to note, and I think we tried to stress in the report that these aggregate figures um, effectively mask the differential impacts of that reduction on, first of all, different sectors of the economy, um, secondly, different areas, so local areas, council areas of Scotland, and also differentiated effects by gender. So I think this was the key message of our report, that we shouldn't just look at overall net migration figures, but how that would differentially affect in terms of geography, sector, and gender. Um, so I think you know one of the, the key things that we discussed was how, uh, in a sense, ending free movement and channeling most migration for work through tier two, which is for skilled uh, migration, um, would disproportionately affect a number of sectors which are typically lower salary um, and which are dependent on um, uh, overseas migration. So sectors such as textiles, social care, leisure and travel, sales, elementary occupations would be um, especially detrimentally affected and um, uh, David Bell will be able to elaborate on some of the effects on, on sectors. Um, and then we also analysed geographically how different areas might be affected and again the analysis of distribution of salaries um, and also the prevalence of certain sectors in different local areas uh, suggests that certain areas, and in particular uh, remote and rural areas, but also other areas facing depopulation and with a preponderance of lower salary jobs would be uh, especially negatively affected in terms of a substantial reduction or perhaps even an impossibility uh, of securing immigration through tier two. So that just summarises some of the sectoral and regional impacts. And I think also of note is the potential gender impact, because if we analyse salary distribution by gender, uh, we find that uh, far fewer female uh, migrants would, or there are far fewer occupations um, uh, in uh, areas typically um, uh, employing females. So that would have, a, again, a disproportionate impact on potential female migration to Scotland. Um, I think I will perhaps hand over to David. Yeah. It could mean that I know that other members want to drill down on the, the, the sector, so I'm going to leave that to them. But I'm particularly interested in the overall impact of these changes, both on public finances and the provision of public services. Yeah, so I think David, who's done the fiscal analysis, yeah. can comment on that. So um, the, the overall um, reduction in uh, labour supply is going to have an adverse effect on output. And the Scottish Government has done quite a lot of work at the kind of macro level, which, which we didn't seek to reproduce here. I, I can't remember exactly when, when the report came out, but the Scottish Government's report does uh, indicate the sort of overall effects on, on the economy. In terms of the public finances, we did do a little bit more nuanced uh, uh, work sort of at the individual level. So there are a number of things that, that, that it's important to take into account. So first of all, um, salaries for uh, EU migrants uh, in Scotland are somewhat less than they are for EU migrants in the rest of the UK on average. <coughs> what that means is that they will be contributing less in terms of taxes uh, than, than EU migrants uh, south of the border. Uh, in terms of their use of public services, what, what we have is typically relatively young people who are not going to make a very significant use of health uh, resources, social care resources, and a, a limited use of, of the benefit system uh, largely because, as our report shows, uh, a, a very high proportion of them are working. What they will perhaps use more of is education resources, so for education for their children. This is common with the rest of the UK, so that, you know there isn't that much difference. And then, w in a sense, we go we go to the the calculations that have been done for the UK as a whole. So at the individual level. At the UK as a whole, uh, EU migrants are uh, uh, net contributors to the public finances rather than net users of, of public finance. We think that uh, the, the margin, the, the sort of surplus that uh, EU migrants in Scotland will generate is somewhat slightly less because of their slightly lower wages 
but we think uh, that that isn't sufficient to offset their, their uh, overall positive contribution to the public finances. And if you look at them sort of in the long term, uh, if, you, if, if you think about them not a, a, as a single snapshot in a particular year, but think of their contribution to the public finances over their lifetime, well, if they stay in Scotland, they will make more use of health resources as they age. They will make more use of social care resources as they age. But what, in effect, you're getting are, are people who are coming into the Scottish labour market already educated. So that part of the public finances has been met by other countries, to be honest. Um, so their overall use, lifetime use, of public services is is that much less than those of uh, of, uh, of uh, Scottish uh, residents or natives. Did Professor Kay want to come in at all? Um, I don't think that was especially my area, right, except okay. perhaps to, to pick up on. Um, you were asking also about public services, and yes. just to come back to the the point about things being differentiated across Scotland, so we know that. In some of the the more rural and remote remote rural places, a small change in the numbers of people coming into, for example, uh, keeping a, a local hospital open or keeping local schools open can make an enormous difference locally, and that that can have then further repercussions not only for migrants in the area but for locally born uh, people. So I have supplementary from Kenneth Gibson. Yeah, it was actually that I was going to uh, talk about. I mean, uh, there's a couple of things. First of all, the difference in salary. For example, East Renfrewshire, you know, 49.5% of EU uh, citizens meet the £30,000 threshold if the UK was to go ahead with that, which it seems it, it is out to consultation on at the moment, whereas only 16% in the Western Isles. But you say in, in, in page 10 of your report that for remote rural areas and islands, attracting working age migrants is the only realistic option to avert a downward demographic spiral driven by the age structure legacy of selective out-migration in the last decades of the 20th century, and you call it a demographic double whammy, likely to have far-reaching implications for economic activity, provision of services and levels of <coughs> general well-being. I'm just wondering, does this mean that, 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 that this could actually affect the long-term sustainability of communities, you know, per se, that some communities might not actually be able to, uh, might not still be here in 10 or 20 years, I don't want to sound alarmist, but if, if this... Um, is implemented. Um, what, what are your fears on that, and, and what, what yeah, is the prognosis? I think that's prognosis? precisely what it means. So there are areas where the only, not only the only current contributor to natural population growth, but the only possible contributor to national pop to, to local population growth is in migration of people of reproductive age. To put it bluntly, so that the the local population is so damaged by out migration, the aging structure of that population is such that it's not possible to for the birth rate to exceed the, the death rate in those areas? Uh, uh, yes, I mean, to, just if I can convene, just two days ago I met the Anne Development Trust who presented figures to uh, two Scottish ministers that we'd meetings <coughs> with who said that uh, they believed that the working age population would shrink in Arran, in my mm. constituency, by 47% mm -hmm. in the next six years alone mm. because so many, there are so many older people who, and people in their 50s who are retiring. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I have great fears that we, we're already having difficulty delivering, for example, care packages yeah. for older people on the island and yeah. sustaining just a lot of everyday services that the yeah. island can, I mean, Tavish will know more about that probably than anyone else here. Um, so it's a, a real a real concern for for me and Mackenstein, and I can imagine how what it must be like for the Western Isles facing that prospect. Yeah, and some work that Cosler did a, a couple of years ago showed that um, local authorities, I think it was about 50% of local authorities across Scotland, put population as their first uh, priority outcome indicator. So it's not just a marginal issue for you know outer aisles or, or particular concerns. I mean, obviously, it's different in different local areas, but it's it's significant for significant numbers of Scottish local areas. Yeah. I, I think, I think uh, it, it's, it's true, too, however, that migration on its own won't, won't solve this problem. Uh, I, think, uh, I think it's important to bear that in mind, but nevertheless, it will contribute to the solution. It, it's, no, it's, not the full, it's not the full story. I, if I may add, I think we should also point out that EU migration has been distinct from previous waves of migration to the UK and Scotland in the, in the sense that it's been much more evenly distributed across all types of area. Mm -hmm. So whereas previous in-migration flows were typically clustered around urban areas, cities, 
uh, EU migration has been much more beneficial than previous flows of migration in terms of its geographical spread. That's not to exaggerate its impact. And so if you look at um, the data which, for example, our colleague Andrew Copus uh, analysed regarding the distribution of in-migration, overseas migration and rest of UK migration to different types of areas of Scotland, of course the urban areas and the mixed areas do see a higher proportion per capita of inflows. So we don't want to suggest that there's been a huge surge of migration to these areas, but very small numbers mm -hmm. to particular local areas can make a significant difference. Well, the areas have lower birth rates as well. Yeah, okay. so a lot of natural increases, you know, of the indigenous population. So it's a kind of that's why you've got that double whammy, haven't you? You've got a lower birth rate for the indigenous population, and, and a higher age structure in fewer. You've also things. got the potential for public services to be damaged by a, con a tighter immigration controls, and that to then stimulate flight from those areas mm -hmm. of locally born people because the hospital closes or because the school closes. So that's, I think, part of what we meant around the. The double whammy. If I can just come back on um, the question about it not being the, the full answer, and maybe here I stray a little bit out of the EAG remit and into my own research, which has very been, much been on migrants' experiences of living also in, in rural and more remote places, I think absolutely there are questions there about uh, the conditions in which people live and the, the uh, softer levers that the Scottish Government has control over to think about what would retain uh, migrants as well as locally born people in those places and there are big questions there about whether migration is a long-term answer because migrants also aspire for their children for example to leave. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, Claire Baker followed by Alexander Stewart. Um, thank you convener. Um, I was interested in those final points because not to go over the recent argument but the document says it's the only realistic option and your um, professor Kay is also an expert in this area um, and I think the points made around how we secure a population there um, are important. Migration is not the only answer in these circumstances. Um, what was interesting was predicting the future trends and the work that the group has done. So the group um, did say that there were three main factors. The change in socio-economic conditions within EU countries, the conditions within the UK and the UK migration policy. Um, and it seems the trends have largely been based on the immigration policy. And conversations um, I've had kind of around European issues, we know that countries such as Poland and Romania, where there have been a lot of migrants come over to the UK, are facing their own demographic challenges. And in some ways see some of this context as an opportunity for them to take people back and help grow their own um, economies. So there's, that's happening at the same time. Why did the group focus more on immigration than the other issues. Yeah. Um, so our, our remit for this commission was specifically to analyse the impacts of the proposals on, in the white paper on uh, migration to Scotland. So we weren't tasked with looking at the potential impacts of Brexit more broadly or changing demographic trends or other political trends or whatever uh, across EU countries. So we, we're, we're very clear that, that those projections are premised on that, that narrow uh, set of variables. So we're holding constant the other variables. However, of course, we would agree with you uh, that we can't hold those other variables constant in the real world uh, and I think you know even if you if you look at just the ONS um, you know quarterly net migration statistics from February you see a substantial decrease in EU in migration and an increase in out migration but especially the EU eight countries um, there's there's a really quite dramatic uh, decrease in in migration and increase in out migration now um, in some senses and now I'm perhaps going beyond the EAG remit we can see this as a natural progression of uh, trends in migration from a particular destination to a particular uh, um, from a particular place of origin to a particular destination and so research on, on migration suggests that it's typical that you get these waves what's often called a migration hump where a particular sending area you know has a, a certain plus of, of you know, working age population, young people who are looking for better opportunities uh, and that they will you know, g g migrate to certain destinations but that, and, and that might have a cumulative effect initially over the first few years so that you get a quite a substantial rise in migration but then that will tend to tail off over time as first of all that supply of potential migrants uh, is reduced as perhaps conditions between the, the origin and destination place converge 
Um, and also, I think in the case of uh, Central East European countries, obviously we're seeing particular demographic trends, ageing population. So arguably, it would be the case that we would have seen that tailing off in any case, even without Brexit and its impacts. Uh, but I think most people would agree that Brexit has um, perhaps uh, perpetuated or accelerated that effect in terms of the quite radical decrease in, in migration from Central East European countries. So, of course, we could do another set of projections where we perhaps speculated a bit more on potential future economic, demographic and political conditions in sending countries. Um, and I think we would perhaps have slightly different projections, but we did stick quite narrowly to our, to our remit. Okay, thank you. And also a link to that question is how the... Um, how the baseline is decided over the five-year period, and you'll be aware of the recent um, birth rate figures for Scotland, which actually started to show a decrease, um, which I think is the first decrease we've seen in, in recent years. Yeah. Um, and so we have our own um, challenges before we even add in yes. the different um, migration policy. Yes. Did you be able to take that into consideration... Um, so, I mean, I, I think one thing that I should note about our baseline is, is that it differs from the NRS baseline, which is based on an average of the last 25 years. So if you look at average net migration in Scotland over the last 25 years, you're, you're looking before the quite substantial increase of net migration uh, in the mid-2000s. Uh, and we decided that we would base it on more recent uh, trends um, for a number of reasons, which I won't go into now. So, so we have different, perhaps a more optimistic uh, baseline than the NRS. In terms of that specific question about birth rates, I think, D David, did you want well, to... Um Yes, it's true. And of course, also it's, it's also true that the, uh, uh, maybe the birth rates declined, but also life expectancy has, has, has actually declined in the last couple of years. Um, <clears throat> for the kind of um, time horizon that we were looking at, uh, the, the effect of lower birth rate is only going to have an effect on the working age population right towards the end of that uh, period of time. The reduction in life expectancy may have implications for health spending and for uh, social care spending, but uh, at the moment, you know, we've only got a couple of a couple of years' data on that, and so by and large, the the uh, changes in the broad assumptions uh, have not been made that would would have a very significant e effect on on the the relationship between the working age population and the the the, the population uh, let's say um, 65 and above who are the ones who who uh, are very expensive in terms of the public finances and just to move on briefly the um <coughs> I mean, you've, you've set out the remit that you're you're working to and appreciate the real the the caution and expressing views on how we go forward, but the document does lay out the impact of the 30,000 suggested threshold and how a 25 or 27 different impacts this would have. Um, could you maybe say um, a bit about, I suppose, do you support or does, does the group support an income threshold in principle and how the income threshold works for people who are already coming through from a non-EU um, situation who are using Tier 2? Do you have any views on how that operates? Just on that general, that, I'll, I'll leave the specific labour market questions to David. Uh, I, I don't think it's our place to comment on whether we think there should be a threshold. I mean, I think one can infer from the analysis in the report that uh, we think that free movement has been very beneficial to Scotland, but I, I won't go beyond that. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, I, I guess you, you're going to have to accept that, there's, uh, that, that you're going to have some kind of uh, filter uh, uh, if, if, if you're not going to have free movement across the board. So the question is, what, you know, what is a good and efficient way... Well, good is a bad word to use. What is an efficient way to, um, to uh, 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 design uh, that kind of filter? Clearly, this is um, the, the way that the MAC uh, has, uh, has decided to go, is, is, is a long... Um, uh, limit in relation to tier two but I mean what we do in the report really is to, is to pull out the implications of that in and relation that, to you know a, a number of different characteristics mm -hmm. uh, and and these are spatial these are uh, related to gender and these are by occupation and uh, you know let me take social care as an example I mean uh, it, it's going to make 
at an industry which is uh, already in some difficulty, uh, uh, struggle, um, basically, because um, uh, social care workers are perhaps, well, are almost certainly paid at a wage which is less than their value to society. Um, and I go through the kind of the, 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 the implications of that might might be along the lines of have because virtually none of them will qualify un under the under this threshold um, that uh, it, it, it may uh, result in more delayed discharge from hospitals. It may uh, uh, cause more carers, predominantly women, to leave the labour market. Uh, if there aren't uh, uh, sufficient uh, social care workers. Now, uh, the UK government m may seek you know, social care workers elsewhere, but they'll still struggle if, with, with, with this tier two limit because basically it's, it's an industry where um, there isn't the, 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 the sort of um, career structure that you have, for example, in nursing. Um, a, and and uh, you know even at the top, a care worker is unlike at the top of her or his profession. Care worker is unlikely to earn thirty thousand pounds. And I know you don't want to, well, you you're not able to express views on future proposals, but from your knowledge of how systems operate, could you have variations if you were to operate a threshold either between countries or regions or would it have to more be by sector or is there a possibility to develop policy in this way? So I think there are a range of options and those have been set out in previous documents. Um, uh, there's a document, for example, which I authored with Sarah Kiambi and uh, Saskia Smelly, which sets out options for a differentiated approach. And I know that um, Eve Hepburn, who's sitting over there, has also uh, written on this for this uh, committee. Um, so. Of course, you can, first of all, use the Scottish um, shortage occupation list. Um, you could vary salary and or skills thresholds for particular regions of the UK and also for particular occupations. I think one of the things which one might infer from this report, but this would be beyond, again, beyond the remit of this report and the EAG, uh, would be to think about differentiation by um, sub area within Scotland. So I think one of the problems with um, relying on sectoral or occupational uh, shortage approaches is that you wouldn't necessarily channel the right level of migration to rural and remote areas, for example. So, for example, if you had uh, particular provisions for, say, chefs or uh, others uh, within the sort of tourism or hospitality uh, sectors, uh, you might get a tendency to um, concentrate on or people channeling to um, uh, urban areas where perhaps uh, you know conditions might be seen as more attractive or it might be a more obvious uh, uh, destination so so what one might consider is looking at say council areas as um, sub national units uh, which might have particular provisions so areas for example facing uh, challenges of depopulation uh, might be subject to uh, either um, specific uh, occupation uh, shortage, shortage approach or a lower salary threshold, for example. So, I mean, again, just to specify, that's just talking in my personal capacity, but there are a range of possible uh, options for differentiation which could address these problems within a single immigration system. Thank you. Thank you. Alexander. Thank you, convener. The White Paper called, about, called on us to consider the greater consensus uh, in immigration policy. Uh, but there's also been talk about the enhanced role of the Migration Committee. Uh, and how would you see that ha enhanced role going forward uh, with the process of the UK immigration policy? So if I might just make a general comment, and I think David may well have something yeah. to, to, to say about that. Um, I mean, I think one of the issues is, and I think this is partly why we were set up as an interdisciplinary group, is that I think it reflects a, a, a desire to frame immigration and the impacts of immigration in a broader way, taking into account both demographic factors, a broader range of social effects of immigration, um, and also looking at the differential effects on different types of local area. So um, I, I think, you know, 
what would be very welcome is if we saw the MAC uh, perhaps broadening to take into account those different uh, perspectives. Um, I'm not sure we envisage that happening. I think it has been very much focused on labour market analysis and fiscal um, analysis. Um, I don't know yeah, if David I, mean, wants yeah, to... I, I think Christine is alluding to the fact that, that, like me, all the members of the MAC are economists. Um, so the focus has been very much on uh, on labour market effects and uh, whether changes to migration policy uh, will have a positive or negative effect on uh, um, native-born workers. That's, that's one major area. Whether they'll have uh, an effect on investment, whether they'll have an effect on technological change, um, uh, so that labour market and then the fiscal impact, which I've already mentioned, has also been a particular focus. And there's been, uh, uh, from the MAC committee, given its composition, it, it isn't surprising in a way that, um, that uh, it, its focus has been almost entirely economic. Focus that it's had. Uh, there's been some calls that maybe it's not fit for purpose in its process because it's not looking at and not expanding and not giving that. We would endorse that view, no. Um, and I think we, we have immense respect for the work of Alan Manning and the analysis, a very rigorous analysis. So insofar as the MAC has carried out analysis, it's, it, you know, it's, it, it's been very rig rigorous in terms of the impacts of immigration, for example, a very positive and welcome contribution to the debate. To the debate. Um, so, yeah, if I yeah, could just... I, mean, I think it has, it has certainly m um, silenced a number of arguments around issues like you know, migrants are, are, are a net drain on, on, on the UK economy, which is clearly not the case. And what dialogue and discussion have yourselves had with the MAC uh, going forward? Uh, has there been a, a good bad or indifferent process on that? I mean, uh, it wasn't part of our remit to engage in formal uh, dialogue with the MAC. I mean, we had quite a short time frame as well to prepare this report. I mean, this was commissioned end of October and we reported in uh, 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 end of February. Um, uh, obviously, we have informal contact with the MAC, but uh, that, that wasn't part of our, our remit. OK, thank you. OK, thank you very much, uh, Anne Bill. Uh, thank you, Peter. Good morning. I'm um, just picking up the, that, that point briefly about the, the status of the MAC. Um, when Professor Manning gave evidence to this committee some time ago, he did concede that there had been no specific financial modelling vis-à-vis -vis Scotland. Now, there's some reference uh, in a letter from the Home Secretary to the committee to the fact that um, in the MAC's interim update prior to publication of the final report, they specifically considered the position of Scotland. It's not clear what that actually means. Does anybody know what that means? What, did they then go back and do rigorous financial modelling in Scotland, or they just did something else? Or? Not, not that I know of. I mean, um, within the time, as Christina has said, we, we didn't uh, have well, sufficient time to do the rigorous uh, um, uh, financial modelling. Uh, what, what we have done is to look at how Scotland compares to the modelling that they had done for the UK as a whole. So there isn't, there's nothing in the in the public domain that I know of, which is a at the same level of detail in relation to um, the effects of migration on the public finances and so on. Uh, in the same level of detail as as was done for the UK as a whole, and we've we've done some very tentative steps, like for example, pointing out that um, unlike other parts of the UK, Scotland bears fiscal risk uh, if there's a, a, a change in migration brought about by a change at, at the UK level. And by that, I mean, because Scotland is now responsible for its own, uh, well, for much of its own tax revenue, if there's a downturn in, uh, in migration uh, amongst people who, for example, pay income tax, so they're earning over 10,000 or thereabouts, it's actually going to impact on on Scotland, uh, on, on Scottish government's revenues, 
although in a complicated way that, that Kenneth Gibson will understand, that has a, 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 an effect coming back through the block grant adjustment. Um, so it's very difficult, it, it's very difficult modeling to do, but nevertheless, um, in relation to other parts of the UK, Scotland is more exposed to um, a, 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 a fiscal risk in relation to changes in migration patterns. Mm -hmm. May I also add that um, there was an analysis uh, in an annex of the white paper, which was published in December, which did talk about the fiscal impacts of the projected 80% reduction in EU uh, migration for the purpose of work. And, you know, the results were really quite dramatic. And partly for that reason, we felt that that argument w had already been made and that insofar as it would more or less apply to Scotland as well, that that was already out there in the public domain and, and had quite sort of uh, severe impacts. Well, thank you for that. Um, I mean, and, and sort of really moving along in, the, in a similar vein, um, because we found our session with Professor Manning to be very... Uh, interesting and indeed somewhat alarming because there, there, there seemed to be just a kind of assumption that uh, a UK immigration uh, policy should uh, not focus on what he said had previously been the position on favouring lower wage, lower skilled sectors. So we then went on to have an interesting discussion about uh, potential impacts of that such an approach for key sectors of the Scottish economy, including tourism and agriculture. Uh, and in that regard, so when uh, uh, the Home, UK Home Secretary replied to the committee convener <coughs> in a letter of 15 February of this year, he said, uh, and I quote the committee, so Mac, were clear that sectors of the economy that normally employ lower skilled migrants, such as tourism, hospitality and agriculture, should compete on wages and work conditions in order to make their sectors attractive uh, to workers. So I just wonder what you feel that that would mean in the Scottish context? Do you want to comment on that? <laughs> uh, so uh, the approach of the MAC, it seems to me, is to, is to say, um, well, if the economy um, uh, is, is suddenly short in, in terms of the supply of a particular kind of labour, uh, i.e., um, EU migrants, how would it kind of react in a market sense to that? So one response might be to um, increase the wage uh, that's being offered uh, and attract natives, native, native born people. Of course, the effect of that is to increase costs, which then increase prices. And then the question is, are you any longer competitive? Um, another approach is, um, uh, another market-based approach might be to say, well, um, let's substitute capital for labour uh, in this sector um, and in, uh, increase investment. And, and you've got to think, well, um, uh, entrepreneurs, producers are making the decisions that they're making because they see this as the best way to uh, uh, produce whatever it is their their um, their enterprise I I is is designed to produce. And let me give you an example of that. Uh, so, thinking about um, agriculture. So uh, you might say, well, no longer have you got uh, uh, cheap EU uh, uh, migrants coming in. You offer higher wages to get uh, native-born people. And if that doesn't work, which probably won't, partly because of the limit and the, the, the areas where uh, that industry is strong is not areas where there are lots of young people that might do these kinds of jobs. And you might say, well, if you can't do that, um, uh, get a machine that will pick your soft fruit. Well, some of these haven't yet been invented so that's an issue. So then you might say, well, let's get out of soft fruit uh, altogether, uh, as a for example, and do have, uh, use the land for some other kind of product, like you know the area that I live in, Perth and Kinross, it's, uh, it would be potatoes probably. Um, but then you're into a different market, the potato market, which 
is not as profitable as the soft fruit sector. So basically farmers are left with a very difficult set of choices uh, in those circumstances. It, you know, it's all very well to sort of to say, well, you should do something else or you should pay more for your workers, but that has implications for uh, economic output uh, and therefore for the incomes of, uh, 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 of the farmers and therefore for the community as a whole. I mean, I think in general, we wouldn't want to rule out that in certain sectors, uh, there might be some benefits from reducing the pool of uh, uh, low, low skilled, low salaried labour, but that one would have to do a sector by sector analysis to really work out what the options are for substituting to either other uh, products or uh, investing in capital and so on. And I, and I think we're, we're lacking that analysis at the moment and that one shouldn't assume there's a blanket solution and, and, and set of responses to that intervention, as is the case, I think with the MAC analysis? I think there was a study done um, towards the end of last year by Scottish Rural College, commissioned by the Scottish Government, um, that looked specifically at agriculture, and I don't remember the exact percentages, but showed very high percentages of um, farmers saying that they would switch to non-agricultural production in the, the case of not having the availability of... Of labour, so I think that, and, and obviously that has repercussions for local communities, for environmental policies, for all sorts of other um, aspects of, of Scottish policy. Indeed, and it has repercussions for the food supply. Yeah, um, uh, and it just seems. I mean, the comment was made that the MAC uh, focus had been entirely economic, but I mean, I would argue that whether economics, therefore, if you imperil your food supply, you endanger the environment, you affect the sustainability of communities right across Scotland. Where, what is the point of being a purist economist? Sorry, I don't mean to be at all disrespectful to, to the three of you, but in, in a very uh, um, broad thrust of a conversation, what is the point of purist well, I, I'm not a purist lawyer. I'm sort of a middle-of-the-road lawyer. <laughs> but what would be the point um, when you see great swathes of destruction? Surely economic modelling is supposed to help and foster economic growth. And I don't know. I'm a lawyer, as Tavish rightly reminded. Nothing but an economist, purist or other. So um, <laughs> responding from that perspective, I think... I mean, I absolutely wouldn't want to be uh, sucked into a conversation about the fit for fitness for purpose or not of the MAC, but I think there is an issue with any kind of approach that doesn't look at the broader repercussions of whether it's looking... You know, my problem as a sociologist is I just look too much at what people tell me and what their experiences are, and I can miss the, the bigger picture, for example, about fiscal effects, and I think that the strength of our group is, is trying to bring those things together. But I absolutely think that perhaps not so much for us, but for uh, people in, you know, in parliaments, there is a, a reason to look at the, these broader repercussions and to try and think how they join up. So, you know, yes, we can talk about mechanisation, but how would that work for social care? And if social care is pro in Scotland is largely purchased by local authorities, then where is the, the room to, to shift the economic modelling for that and to raise the salaries? There might be very good reasons. You know, David already said it's paid below its social value. Um, and I certainly wouldn't want to argue for a model that says, well, migrants will accept low wages, so that's fine. We just continue to provide low social care below its value. But there's a much bigger set of, of issues that need to be taken into consideration with that. If I, if I can just make a last point, too, and it relates to what Christina just said. I, I mean... We tend to think of this through the the perspective of the short term, and I, you know you think about the adjustments that have to be made uh, in the in the short term. It's probably true that the MAC has been taking a kind of long term perspective because investment, you know, or change of 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 the the uh, uh, type of production you're doing is really a medium to long term. Um, uh, venture and and therefore you know in a sense um it there's bound to be short-term disruption it it seems to me whether there can be long-term success out of this uh is is a is an open question but but you know when you restrict labor supply the the ultimate um, the the economics answer is that uh, that uh, is bound to have a negative effect on growth and incomes. Okay, thank you for that. I mean, I I, I also.
uh, I mean, very interesting, all your comments, and particularly Professor Kay's comments, that we shouldn't just accept as a matter of principle um, low wages below social value, and I don't. But I, I do, nonetheless, I, I'm a pragmatist, and we are where we are at the moment, and we need to get perhaps to other places, but you know, we can't do that overnight, and nor can these individual sectors, particularly agriculture and tourism. One last question, you know, uh, just picking up the seasonal workers pilot. I mean, what's, you know, wh where does that currently stand in numbers and where, where are we in terms of and the modelling that you perhaps did and uh, the likely impact of, of that and seasonal agricultural workers? I don't know which one. I, 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 Professor Bell, that maybe yeah. has. I, I mean, my uh, um, understanding is that it, it's two and a half thousand people across the UK as a whole. And uh, Scotland has about 14% of the seasonal workers, so it has well in its excess of its population share of the seasonal workers. Uh, but if it got 14.6% of two and a half thousand, you know, I, I see uh, um, a, a soft fruit farms in, a, in around Blair Gowrie that, you know, two or three of them would, would mm -hmm. absorb all of these. Uh, so it, uh, you know, it's it's a pilot. It's I think it's not meant to be the whole solution. So, so uh, we'll see how it develops. And it's non-EU uh, 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 migrants. So um, we'll see how it develops. But uh, you know, it would have to be expanded very uh, considerably yeah, if the if the, if the uh, that. You know these season the, these agriculture related industries that need seasonal workers mm. are, is to be maintained and and it's got to be said that these are the parts of agriculture that in Scotland that have been growing fastest yeah. in recent years. Would, would Professor Bell be able to put a figure on what we would need to see numbers wise? Is that have you been able to well, make any assessment? At, of we that? can look at the yeah. saws when it was in existence. Mm. So the saws admitted uh, had a had a cap of twenty one thousand two hundred and fifty until it was discontinued in 2016. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> I would assume at least that level, but you can see the difference between that and the 2,500. But, I mean, I, you know, we should emphasise it's, it's a pilot scheme. And I think another thing that we haven't yet mentioned, of course, when we're talking about adjustment from, quote, dependence on, on, on uh, lower, lower wage um, models and so on, we have to take into account that there is a proposed transitional uh, channel for um, migrants at all skills level proposed in the white paper which might potentially run until 2025 it's a bit short on detail but one of the key provisions of that is that there would be a maximum 12 month period um, of living and working in the UK followed by a 12 month cooling off period and um, one of the things that in particular I think um, Becker's analysis uh, has pointed to is some of the detrimental impacts of that very short term uh, approach to, to, to migration on local communities. So I, I think if there's interest, perhaps we could briefly just say something about that. Um, so I, th I mean, for me, I think that also comes back to this question of the different impact, the different areas of impact and the different policy areas at both sort of national government and local government level that we then come into. So it seems to me that one of the fundamental differences between uh, the understanding of, of migration and, and the wish to resolve, for example, demographic and local sustainability issues through migration as a part of that picture within Scotland is markedly different from a, a UK-wide perspective that is focused on bringing down net m numbers of migration and actually especially for lower skilled workers focusing on very temporary schemes with specific blocks to longer term settlement. And that's something that freedom of movement circumvented. Um, and the, the temporary scheme that's proposed for uh, lower skilled, lower paid uh, ave my, ag avenues of migration is very specifically designed to prevent anybody staying longer term. There's a 12-month limit and there's a 12-month cooling off period. So once you've been for a year, you have to leave for at least a year before you come back. Um, that has implications for employers, where in a lot of the seasonal migration that we've seen over the last 10 years or so, there's been a lot of circular migration, so the same people coming back regularly, year on year. Um, employers, therefore, not having to retrain them, not having to get re-induct them, if you like, either into the business or into the local area. And for some people, that then, over um, a period of time, shifting from circular patterns of migration to longer term periods of stay and eventually to, to sometimes to permanent settlement and um, there's a coming together again within Scotland of the areas that most perhaps 
need people to stay longer and to bring family members with them and those that would be most likely only to be able to bring people in through these temporary schemes which as well as the temporary nature of the stay and the cooling off period specifically um, say you can't come with dependents so you can't come with children you can't come with non-working spouses so there are there are ongoing kind of repercussions in that again particularly for uh, more peripheral areas indeed very gloomy but thank you for your can I just ask uh, Professor Kay a supplementary to that? I mean, what are the the, so, the social implications for that shift from long term to short term migration? Because one of the the one of the things that we've noted uh, in our previous discussions about post two thousand and four uh, movement to Scotland is the um, is the the way that the populations who have come here have actually really enhanced. Mm -hmm. uh, communities in Scotland have made them more diverse and they have integrated extremely well in making mm -hmm. really important social contributions to those mm -hmm. communities. Um, will there be a shift um, yeah. if we move to short term? I think the social implications again are potentially quite gloomy. Um, I think it's important not to paint an overly rosy picture of people's experiences of migration to Scotland. I think there are people with very good experiences and people who have done precisely what you've just described. We certainly found, um, especially in more peripheral areas, people ex experiencing quite severe social isolation, um, quite severe difficulties with improving their English language because of their, their work-life balance, because of their, their working uh, regimes and so on. But, but not to get too much into that, I nonetheless think that one of the hardest um, sorts of migration to manage at the local community level is one where there's huge amounts of churn. So if you have somebody coming where they know they can only come for a year, they know they can't come back for another year, um, <coughs> they're going to work in you know, a fairly low-skilled uh, form of employment, probably working very long hours in order to make as much money as they can before they leave. Why would they spend time going to ESOL classes? What's their motivation for doing it? Yes, you will get some people who come for a year to improve their English, younger people, students who may be very motivated to do that. But they, then there are other issues about their, their reasoning or not for integrating within a community, spending a lot of time in community spaces, their, their, their possibilities for doing that. The other thing I think it's important to think about is that over the past 10 years, local authorities have invested quite considerable time and resource, both financial and human resource, in trying to build up uh, systems to support the patterns of migration that have developed under free movement. Now, I am certainly not uh, wanting to say that, move, that, that migration from other areas of the world than the EU are of their own, of, uh, by definition, worse or more problematic, or those are people we don't want because they're not European, but it would require new investment and realignment of those provisions if they have to deal with very different language groups, very different cultural groups, and people who are coming and going on a much more uh, constant basis. Yeah. So some of the worst experiences we heard about in terms of local communities, for example, is the example of very seasonal migrant workers living you know, outside the town, being bussed in once a week into the local Morrisons. None of them speak English. Nobody understands what they're doing. They don't understand what they're doing. And there's no opportunity for those communities to come together. Yeah. And we'd see a lot more of that kind of thing. Well, potentially. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Thank you very much. Ross Creer. Thanks, Come here. Um, I'd like to... Um, well, I was going to say I'd like to come back to the minimum income threshold, but since we've just been talking about the 12-month residency, 12-month co-op, stick with that for a moment. Um, is there any international precedent for a similarly developed country having set a policy like this? I realise there is no precedent for the wider situation that the UK is now in, but is there precedent for this kind of policy for 12-month residency followed by, or regardless of the time limit, of a residency period followed by a cooling off period? There are quite extensive examples of that. So the typical approach of OECD countries uh, trying to regulate lower skilled uh, migration, uh, especially seasonal migration, is, is to, to look at it in terms of quite limited rights and quite short periods of stay. Now, whether that's a constructive approach is another question. There are, having said that, some examples of countries which have had uh, schemes specifically to recruit people across the skills uh, uh, spectrum or specifically for lower skilled um, uh, occupations which are uh, facing acute shortage 
stages uh, where they have offered more accommodating packages of, of rights and pathways to longer term settlement or even in the case of some of the provincial or regional programs in for example Canada or Australia or New Zealand uh, you do actually get programs which offer pretty much the full set of uh, uh, rights including access to permanent residence from the outset including in some cases although limited cases in some cases for those uh, which which are, are, are lower lower skilled um, or lower salaried so there are some precedents but I just want to I think the overall picture is that OECD countries do tend to differentiate between uh, lower skilled where they have much more restrictive packages of rights and and settlement opportunities and higher skilled where there is this sort of competition for quote uh, you know the best brains attracting human capital where actually uh, you know the red carpet is rolled out in terms of uh, rights and the attractiveness of those packages you mentioned whether uh, the the net result of, of those policies was constructive or not is a separate question if I could ask that question then is that something you've looked at or any of you have any particular background knowledge on whether that has uh, taking aside the, the social impact for a moment which we've just discussed whether there is a net economic uh, positive outcome to policies like that I, mean, I think it's very difficult to analyse, and it depends which lens you take to, to, to look at the effects. If you're looking at meeting particular shortages, for example, I think you can definitely see positive effects. Uh, there are, um, I mean, longer term, I think it, it's quite difficult to model those effects. Um, but I think, for example, take, I mean, in uh, the New Zealand Canterbury, I mean, also thinking about regional <laughs> programmes, uh, the Canterbury uh, programme, for example, which was across different skills level, was seen to be quite successful. Quite often these things are adopted over a period of years where the economy is facing particular or the, you know, dem particular economic or demographic challenges, and then they might be phased out. So these tools are often uh, sort of adjustable. Um, but, but I think the experience, especially, I'd, I'd say, of the, quote, settler countries of um, Canada, Australia, uh, New Zealand, also Spain has some uh, precedent for this, uh, Sweden as well. Um, I think their experiences are that, that it's a very useful tool for meeting uh, immediate labour shortages. In terms of modelling the longer term effects, I mean, that's obviously much more complex. Uh, David, would you like to say something about that? I, I haven't, I haven't uh, actually got, got uh, any experience of that. I mean, clearly, um, in general, um, people who... Uh, are involved in these schemes and these schemes themselves are probably uh, ones that do involve um, uh, the kind of uh, uh, work that doesn't need a lot of training, uh, that um, a career progression is not, is not something that um, is likely to be an issue. So um, you get, you end up with with uh, relatively low skilled people working as, as as Becky says very long hours, uh, just trying to get to to get sufficient income to do something else perhaps. But it, but it 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 engenders uh, amongst the participants uh, you know a quite a short term perspective. It's not a career perspective if if that's the kind of thing you're. I mean Go on, yeah. so just one scheme which uh, is an exception yeah. to that is that Canada had a live-in care worker um, or a live-in worker scheme, uh, which was, I think, um, uh, closed down uh, a short time ago. But that actually offered this package where in order to attract people to these quite unappealing jobs, uh, they offered permanent residency, and but then you had to work in that job for five years. So in a sense, it was a sort of doing a, a deal, accepting a package that you would do this unappealing job for five years, but then you would would be in a sense liberated uh, and you would have family reunion and permanent residence so you know some countries take that decision that, that in these very difficult to fill unappealing jobs you that 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 might be the offering i think there's one final thing about the temporary scheme that um raises cause for concern for me based on the experiences of that we've seen migrants having in lower paid jobs during the period of free movement, and that is that during the period of free movement, they have simultaneously had access to social benefits, social housing, um, tax credits, and other, other forms of support. So what's not clear to me, the, the, the temporary scheme says that will not be available, there'll be no recourse to, to public funds, um, whether then some of the lower paid work will actually provide people with an income that 
they are able to live on and live on successfully, even for a relatively short period, and even given that they won't be coming with dependents, also raises some, some level of concern for me, because we've certainly seen people being very attracted by that, that you could have a relatively low-paid job, but, for example, access social housing and therefore live quite well, um, by comparison, for example, to what was available in a rural part of Poland or Romania. But that, that begins to be brought into question by this new scheme, I think. Given that we've got a minimum wage that's below the minimum amount you need uh, to live above the poverty line, I think if you're just reliant on the minimum wage and not on public funds, it is impossible to have a, any decent quality standard of living. But to, to move on to the minimum income threshold, quite a, a specific question uh, around um, other uh, countries who've used similar policies. Are you aware of the methodology by which they have come to decide what that threshold is? Because there's been much debate here around... Why, the £30,000 was essentially arbitrary. It depends on, on the, the sort of system. So, for example, in Sweden, uh, the social partners are very involved in uh, setting uh, a, a minimum wage per sector. Um, so then that reflects a different corporatist culture in Sweden. I don't think that would necessarily be replicable um, here, or it can be set through analysis, labour market analysis. Yeah, and those I mean, are the yeah, two obvious approaches. Yeah, it, uh, I mean, I think the MAC... Um, I can't recall exactly, but I think chose a, a particular point in the income distribution. So the the, the you know the, so say median income is twenty five thousand, thirty thousand is, is is well is is quite a bit above the median, and and, and therefore excludes workers uh, who are um, uh, unskilled or relatively unskilled. Uh, in in terms in terms of UK qualifications, uh, that's a, that's a different approach. Clearly, it's not a consensual approach. It's just it is pick a number, and it does depend on the particular way that income is distributed in the country that uh, that uh, is making the decision. And one thing I I think we point out is that uh, that um, EU workers or the income distribution. Uh, of EU workers in the UK tends to be at more polarised than even the UK distribution in the sense that some do really, really well and some do, and, and I suppose this has been most of the focus of our discussion this morning, some do pretty poorly. They, you know, they, they, they do long hours uh, for relatively low rates of pay. So even if you move the... Um, uh, um, threshold to median income or even to 25% below median income is still not going to pick up some of these people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, Gash. I'm going to uh, follow Annabel um, Ewing's uh, sensible line of questioning about the um, seasonal agricultural workers scheme, because I think the figures you've given are that and I think David was hinting at this, that only 365 workers would come into Scotland under this uh, pilot, compared to, what, the 9,300 seasonal workers that are currently engaged in Scottish agriculture. I mean, that's the end of the food industry. I think, I think there... This is hearsay, but I think there, sure. there are already difficulties yeah. in, in that sector. There are. There are. Yeah. 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 Um, what I was actually wanting more was, you've all mentioned uh, some sectoral analysis. I mean, has there been any detailed sectoral analysis done in the context of this overall approach across tourism? There's some figures for agriculture, which you've illustrated, um, but tourism, the care sector, uh, so, key industri industry industries. Yeah, sectors. so... There's sort of been some macro analysis that the Scottish Government has yeah. done that doesn't actually go a, a, a target sector by sector. Yeah. Uh, in the time available, we didn't think we'd be able to do that. I, 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 I tried with some other sectors. Yeah. I tried with nursing and I actually tried with the, with the hospitality sector. But you have to engage with or to find the key people to engage with. Yeah. I thought I had, but but maybe yeah. I didn't. Okay. Um, but that certainly there is room to, to do that. I mean, hospitality and, and some public services, and including nursing, mm. are, 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 are sectors that could, um, you know, it, it, it would be beneficial to have more detail on, on, on these particular areas. Just if we're going to argue for a change in policy, because it's good to be debt, because this approach would be detrimental to the... 
well, to every aspect of the Scottish economy, never mind the sociological arguments that you've rightly been raising as well, we need more detail. We, I mean, I, we can argue the abstract, it's wrong, yeah. but this, this is one of those issues that absolutely needs detail, I think, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, it, it depends which, what kind of lens you want to look well, through it. In a sense, we've, we have quite reasonable spatial information and we're, we're able to do that with with the data we've got it's it, it's difficult to do it industry by industry unless you engage industry yeah. by industry that i don't have enough um uh, raw data to to do that analysis on my own and and migrants are are are, are difficult to to survey in a kind of general survey that you know that's meant to catch the whole of the Scottish population, obviously they, they move around more, more difficult to trace their addresses, um, and especially when they're moving back and forth, it's difficult to interview them. Mm. So there are there are difficulties, but but you know with the right um, effort, I, you know we could certainly pick an, a, a few other industries and and expand on the uh, on the analysis that we've done. Thank you for that. The final question I was going to ask actually about, was about your sector, which is the university sector. I mean, I don't know if you've done any analysis there. My brother-in-law is a university professor at Aberdeen. They're losing contracts and, um, and academic links to um, both European and other worldwide universities that they've had for years and years and until this thing is sorted out. What, what's your sense of, I mean, again, again, have you done any analysis of that? And, because I think the universities in themselves could be described as a powerhouse of the Scottish economy. Any decent analysis in this area? I mean, Universities UK has recently yeah. done some analysis, and uh, I mean, some of that also involves uh, specific examples of people who are reconsidering their stay uh, in in the UK, including EU nationals who are thinking of returning home. I think the thing that we've got to remember here is that um, academic academic salaries would typically meet the thirty thousand yeah, pound sure. threshold, but there are a range of uh, administrative professional support roles which wouldn't meet the thirty thousand mm pound -hmm. uh, threshold, and uh, uh, Scottish universities are, are very dependent on EU nationals to fill many of those roles. Um, so I think there would be a big hit, but I think beyond the tier two, so even if formally uh, academics can enter through tier two, it's not a popular route. No. Now the white paper does uh, 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 suggest that in many ways it's going to be uh, made more flexible for employers. Um, the, the resident labour market test, for example, would, would be abolished, the uh, skills charge as well. Uh, so to some extent we might see a relative easing of uh, the conditions for non-EU nationals who currently come un under Tier 2 and some of them under Tier 1 as well. But for EU nationals, and I think it's, what, 24% of academic uh, staff, certainly in the University of Edinburgh, my university, are yeah. EU nationals, uh, uh, we're already seeing the effects of, uh, the, the, this, in a sense, the sort of signalling that Brexit is giving yeah. about the UK as not being a welcoming uh, country, um, uh, some uh, projecting a uh, projection of what's going to happen in the event of not having access to certain streams of EU funding. So the un uncertainty over EU funding and especially uh, ERC and Marie Curie grants in particular um, really will influence people's decisions on where they will be located. So even assuming the best scenario of very liberal, very easy uh, uh, tier two, which academic staff can enter under, I think we'll still see quite a negative hit for the UK education sector. And I think the funding is absolutely crucial here. Um, as well. I mean, apart from that, of course, there's the impact on students and the availability of uh, post-study work opportunities mm -hmm. and so on. And there is uh, some moderate liberalisation there, but really not extensive. And I think really not putting us in a competitive position vis-a-vis -vis other countries which are expanding and improving the offering to uh, international students. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Did you have a supplementary, Kenneth Gibson? Yeah. Just first to follow on from that, actually, I actually had a professor who's German who um, actually uh, taught at Harriet Watt, he was returned to Germany because it, the atmosphere he feels that's been created by this scenario has made him feel unwelcome here. Um, but no, I was going to uh, ask, uh, you know, do you consider that the, the UK government uh, proposals could trigger the no uh, detriment provisions of the fiscal framework, David? Um, that's a good question. Um, I thought you were the man to answer it. Yeah. Um, well, uh, we're we're up for a, we're up for a, a review quite soon, aren't we? Uh, um, but the uh, so the the, the okay the, <laughs> the uh, issue is whether Scotland uh, in the interim cannot be made worse off if its per capita income income tax per head drops below. Um, a relative to the UK per capita income tax per head. Um, 
I'm looking at uh, what uh, recent developments and trying to assess whether the Scottish economy, I mean, assuming that the whole of the UK economy takes a hit, will the Scottish economy take a worse, yeah. worse hit? Is, is, and I'm, and this is nothing to do with the EAG report. A, I'm uh, uh, starting to wonder that, that sectors in Scotland that will uh, probably be hit include some we've mentioned, hospitality and, 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 and food production, uh, uh, certainly. But we are not uh, as exposed in relation to, to other sectors that, that are clearly already in crisis, like autom autom the automotive sector. Um, so, and, and, and companies that have very cro close cross-channel links. Scotland's not obviously not so involved in that. So um, the whole picture is relatively bad. Whether it's relatively worse in Scotland, I've uh, my guess at the moment is that is that perhaps it is not. But uh, I that would be a rash um, forecast to hang my. Um, Reputation on. <laughs> yeah. It's such a such a sparkling reputation. To <laughs> the uh, uh, David's very well respected. <laughs> um, uh, but do you think more research should be actually done on that post Brexit to, to see oh, yes. where Absolutely. Scotland lies Absolutely. within that? And I mean, it, it is a reality that some sectors will be seriously. I mean, fish processing, for example, is one yeah, we sure. touched on. But yeah. that's one. So I think that's one that we really need to get our teeth into in the, the months yeah. ahead. Yes, I Th agree. Thanks for that. Does your group have the capacity to undertake additional additional work? I think it's envisaged that uh, we will have uh, uh, future commissions. As, uh, I mean, we were set up initially for a period of one year, and then I think in the autumn, the uh, Scottish Government will review how to take it forward. But I think we are expecting further work to be commissioned right. from us. So you've had discussions along those lines with the Scottish Government, have That's you? That's right, and they're ongoing. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, uh, good morning, panel. Just a, a question regarding uh, students. Um, also, the Home Secretary announced on the 28th of January uh, that also if the UK leaves without a deal, then uh, the UK government will seek to end free movement as soon as possible. But uh, also, also introduced, uh, uh, considering introducing through the Immigration Bill, uh, this uh, transition uh, aspect regarding to say longer than three months. Uh, so students, they will they need to apply for permission to receive European temporary leave to remain, which is valid for a further three years. Uh, are you aware of any reciprocal uh, type of um, agreement that the UK has engaged with, uh, with uh, the EU27? The reason for that question is um, if, if a student goes to study in, uh, in other countries, uh, potentially they could be there for longer than three months. Uh, in my case, when I went to study, uh, in my uh, third year at university, I was in France for four months, then uh, in Germany for four months. Uh, so I'm just, uh, in terms of uh, some 17,000 students actually leave the UK uh, to go and study in the, in the EU uh, every year. Uh, um, just, will this make it, uh, is there going to be anything actually going to make it a bit easier for them? Uh, or will, it's, uh, will it be continually uh, a complicated situation? Uh, I'm not sure. The answer to that. It's certainly true that if it were not possible for them to go for more than three months, it would affect <coughs> a, a large number of students. I don't know whether there are reciprocal agreements that are being discussed. Okay. Individual universities have agreements with other institutions abroad and, 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 and use these extensively, but of course uh, have to, have to um, abide by whatever uh, uh, regulations they're faced with, so you know it, it's common to have uh, arrangements with U.S. universities, which of course share the four-year as opposed to the three-year um, undergraduate degree. Uh, I work in the Central East European Studies Unit. We have agreements with institutions in Kazakhstan, Russia, Ukraine. It's possible to make these agreements out with the EU, but they're complicated. And I would have thought the greater effect would be a potential shift in the fee structure. So obviously EU nationals now benefiting from not having to pay fees in Scottish universities. So if that's, that's changed, I think that would have a much more significant impact. 
Okay, no, that's helpful. Thank you for that. Uh, and just a question following on from uh, Kenneth Gibson's question a few months ago. Um, uh, when he asked the question regarding the, well, it was like a finance uh, question that I mean, the issue of the no detriment. Um, but certainly in the in the executive summary of the report in front of us, it does indicate that um, if there is a type of economic change, then Scotland uh, could be disproportionately uh, affected. Uh, but that seemed to, to conflict oh, with... It's in relation to migration. Uh, yes. uh, um, uh, my response to Ken was in relation to Brexit as a whole, I think. And uh, yeah, it, w it was outside the, the EAG. OK. Well, that's helpful. Just wanted to get some yep. clarification. Thank you. Yep. Well, thank, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just to wind up... Um, when Professor Manning was here, um, I had a brief discussion with him about the, the Canada model of um, differentiated migration in different provinces, um, which the MAC had appeared to dismiss, although there was um, there was evidence that uh, our advisor, uh, Dr Eve Hepburn, ha had raised from the Canadian government that the retention rates of immigrants in different uh, provinces was actually quite high. It was about 82 per cent, um, although there was differentiation across the different provinces. Clearly, it's an area that, you know, there's some, <coughs> you know, uh, different views on. Uh, I wondered if that's something that you would be exploring in the future, um, differentiated migration systems. I mean, I, I, it's possible that we might look at, again, although I think there has been quite a lot of study of different possible systems for differentiated migration policy, we could revisit that potentially. But again, I think we're probably not going to be asked to develop recommendations. Um, I think, I mean, I would just note on the retention rates. I mean, I don't think they're a particularly robust systematic uh, figures, but you can approach it either way. I mean, you can take the figures, 82% seems quite high compared to what I've seen, but you can take the figures and say, well, they're losing quite a substantial share, or you can say, well, actually, they're retaining quite a substantial share, and that, that, that has to be a success. I mean, I think the point about those systems is that they build in a propensity to stay in the particular uh, region from the outset through the points-based system, how it's adjusted. So, for example, uh, such systems can privilege those with existing ties or family or who've studied in particular areas and then you can use soft levers to try to make uh, continued stay longer term settlement more appealing uh, for potential migrants so I, so I think that's really where the focus would be but I would just say one final point about those systems I mean I think we have to be quite cautious about uh, drawing lessons from countries with quite a different history of migration and let's say different uh, uh, public philosophies or, or traditions of thinking about immigration. So, you know, Canada, Australia, uh, New Zealand, they're what we call settler countries who define themselves, their national identity is very caught up in thinking about themselves as countries of immigration. The UK is quite distinct. And I think when we discuss uh, options for uh, something like the Canadian or Australian system, we have to bear in mind that those are systems which are very rigid and robust in the way they select. But once somebody's in, they have a very full set of rights and access to permanent residency from the outset. Now, that in many ways is an appealing model. And now I'm speaking in my personal capacity, but it would be quite a shift from uh, the approach to UK immigration that we've seen uh, since the Second World War and also across European countries. So I just think we have to bear in mind that we can't uh, sort of neatly or simply import models from yeah, different that, systems. That, yeah, I, I totally take that point. Um, so what, in, in, from a Scottish perspective, given you know the very, very dire challenges challenges that we face and um, that you've outlined uh, very articulately today you know what should we be looking at going forward so again I don't know I don't really want to be drawn on this but I think there are two ways of looking at it one can look at you know what would be the the ideal design of an immigration policy which was differentiated and took into account Scotland's perspectives or one can adopt a more pragmatic approach and say what do we think is the margin for maneuver within uh, the proposed changes to the migration system and look at different ways of tweaking or adjusting or uh, having variation within uh, you know the the, the, the points-based system that we have in the UK. So, for example, different types of differentiated uh, approach within Tier 2. So I think those are the two different ways of, of looking at it, and I don't think it's my position really to comment on which is better. Does anyone else want to come in on that? Well, I, I, I mean, I think, in a way, we need a, a, an approach to place um, uh, that perhaps we haven't had in the past, and 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 it's, you know, the background is demographic change, 
and 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 some parts of Scotland are going to have quite different experiences from from other parts of Scotland, and and we really need to to develop uh, develop a, a, a broader understanding of the of the social and the economic implications of that migration is part of the story, but it can't be the it can't be the whole thing, and 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 we need to have a sort of debate about. What is the way that Scotland best addresses the demographic challenge and the implications it has for the sort of uh, within Scotland demography, the distribution of people across different parts of the country? Thank you. Yeah, I would second that. I mean, I think if from Scotland's perspective something UK wide is problematic because it assumes Scotland's the same as the rest of the UK, then it needs to be recognised that, you know. Aaron is not the same as Glasgow and that there, there needs to be differentiation within Scotland. But I think the other thing for me that's often missing within discussion of migration policy is migrant perspectives and actually thinking about what the experience of being a migrant is and how that differs in different places and differs depending on this full package of uh, rights and experiences somebody has. So when we look at um, issues around retention in place, when we look from migrant perspectives, what makes people stay longer term, there's a cumulative effect of being somewhere over a period of time, there's a really important impact of whether you're able to have children with you once children go to school, once children become embedded in a system, families become much more reluctant to leave. And those things often seem to get kind of skimmed over or missed um, in discussions that sort of assume as long as we make it possible, of course, everyone will come. Or as long as we make it possible, of course, everyone will go to London. So, you know, th those things need to, I think, be slightly more nuanced in debate. OK, well, at that, I think we will close our evidence session. Thank you very much to all of you for coming to give evidence to us today. And we shall now move uh, the committee into private session. Thank you. <laughs>